Nick Yada Bowls, Emihi Ne Ko Duncan Grieve, Tokuinoa. No guest this week. Uh, it's me doing another in my occasional series of monopods um, for reasons which I'll, I'll sort of detail at the end. Uh, but also just because there's been a few media stories around lately that I'd like to address, but most specifically, probably the biggest media story of the year, which is revelations that, that emerged uh, last Friday, as I record this, that uh, RNZ, a Safford RNZ had been altering wire copy from the likes of Reuters and the BBC to give a distinctly pro-Kremlin slant to, to coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The and subsequently that has that's been expanded to there's been references in, in stories about China, about Israel, about Cuba to to really kind of give a sense that there is a there's there's just been a lot of uh issues kind of found here. And I think, you know, to to everyone's credit, the story was taken incredibly seriously. You know, there was a, a brief moment when it was you know, when it might have been kind of not laughed off, but dismissed as the, the um, you know, a, a sort of a rogue story editor. Um, but, and, and that it still, to this point, feels like the core of it, as it was uh, a, a single person who clearly had a particular sort of matrix of views and has been periodically imposing that on stories they have published to the RNZ site. But... It also is broader than that. There's there's questions it raises about the level of oversight uh, of of that copy and of just a broader readership of it, both within the RNZ audience and uh, the 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 RNZ staff. You know that these were as soon as you saw them, it's just you immediately clock that there are very significant issues with what's been done here. So the fact it wasn't picked up. It does raise issues about process and, and about just total audience for for this kind of thing. But the thing was, and, and this is obviously another big thread to it, is it wasn't uh, like it wasn't picked up by some members of their audience. There were complaints made. These were essentially ignored by the looks of things. And that that's pretty troubling because, you know, even if the most cursory checking of, of what was alleged, it would have been immediately clear that this was an issue and not just a small one. Um, like I said, to, to RNZ's credit, it's taken it incredibly seriously. Uh, the board met yesterday, as, as I record, to essentially set terms of reference and appoint an external panel to investigate it. That panel, which includes Willie Ako and Linda Clark, is, is very senior, very serious people. And as my colleague Toby Manhai um, pointed out this morning, the the re terms of reference are very broad, and if I was to sort of posit a a sense in which this might perversely become a positive for RNZ, it's that like part of why why this is so one of the things that that's been so strange about this is that RNZ is still essentially running two newsrooms. Like in 2023, it does not have an integrated uh, newsroom. It runs a, essentially like a, an audio basically a radio newsroom and and a digital newsroom that that really is quite unconscionable even you know the the that was quite typical in uh, print newsrooms up until you know kind of 2010 2011 in some places but the that big integration piece typically happened back then you couldn't you can't really justify having uh, the, these two different operations running sort of separate from one another and so, you know, if you want to talk about glass half full, because of the terms of reference, there is an opportunity for RNZ to do what it should have done a long time ago, which is re-engineer its, its news operation to be a single newsroom that, that creates a bunch of different types of output. Um, but that is, you know, that, that's a long way down the road yet. As of now, we're going to, you know, over the, the course of the next month or so, see where this came from, see where the failures of oversight were, see what to what extent it's personnel versus process. And it's a very awkward time for RNZ for this to be happening. They've just been given $25 million a year, essentially 
being told that they were the the favoured child out of the the uh, failed merger of TVNZ and RNZ. It's a very significant sum in the context of RNZ's budget. It equates to a fifty percent increase in in funding or thereabouts. And what a you know you can you can view this against this scandal in two ways. One of which is well, this is what happens when you have an under-resourced uh, company that they don't have enough sub-editors or, or they can't create enough staffing to to really protect the news product and, and it was inevitable. There's another which is actually, is it right to reward a company which has, you know, as, as Mark Jennings pointed out in his very good coverage of it, has had, had declining ratings, decli- uh, both online and on radio, and a known kind of diversity problem in terms of some of its highs. So, you know, I think that, that you know, and, and I think both of those arguments, that there's some merit in the pair of them. Uh, so, look, th- this, this is a massive story, a massive problem for RNZ. It is ongoing. It feels like every couple of days uh, there are new stories that that are discovered, that, that have um, issues associated with them. You know, it it's it goes right to the the heart of of the the sort of integrity of the news operation, and the timing is sucks in another way, in that we are going through a, a level of trust crisis in media, which which is really quite unprecedented. I I went to a New Zealand First rally last week, and. Um, you know, both the questions from the crowd and, and Winston Peters' response from the stage, you know, made explicit reference to the Public Interest Journalism Fund, described it as a bribe uh, for, for media to stop, to not criticise the government. That's absolutely untrue, but it is a way that a lot of people understand the media. I think there are other issues, some of them to a certain extent valid, that people have with the media at the moment, which um, which have eroded trust. An event like this, you know, it erodes trust in RNZ, it erodes trust in, in all of us, and it's a it's a real problem. So that, on some level, is why it has had to be taken so seriously by by the board and, and executive at RNZ and why they're really, you, you can't get out of this without making a really substantive uh, response. It just won't look like you're taking it seriously otherwise. Uh, so we'll, we'll watch the space. One one more thing I wanted to make reference to. I was having a conversation with my colleague uh, Anna Rafati Connell this morning, and she she talked about the fact, and I think that this is I haven't seen this uh, raised anywhere. I think it's it's a really important point. Is that part of this is because RNZ in a digital space is trying to at least partially compete on volume, not necessarily with the New Zealand Herald and stuff, which are the, obviously by far the largest volume players. I think that's essentially impossible. But certainly it's it's trying to create probably more than it can naturally with the level of staffing it has, even notwithstanding its uh, wire copy relationships. And you know, she sort of critiqued that in a way um, – Based on you know, you really shouldn't try and make more than than you can plausibly do with your stuff. Now, on some level, that's that's obvious, but but I think there's really something in it that there is a natural instinct to when you're measuring your success by page views or by audience scale to say, well, we just ha- we don't have any choice. You know, I think RNZ publishes around forty stories a day, whereas you know the, the likes of Newsroom, the spin-off, um, business desk published somewhere between ten and twenty, typically. That, and there, we are all in that kind of subscale um, size. But I think, tellingly, for for any of those those three that aren't competing with the really big volume players, there, there's a you know there's a decision that's been made. Just ultimate size is not going to be our measure. The other thing that I think RNZ could do, and this could potentially flow out of this, you know, some kind of merger of the newsrooms, is it, it, in addition to trying to chase volume for volume's sake, it also can feel like it's trying to create news formats that most closely resemble the likes of stuff in the Herald. When, you know, I think that one of the most interesting and impressive 
uh, text news innovations, online news innovations of the last 10 years has been the rise of Axios, which is very much around acknowledging that your audience is time poor and compressing the, the bare essentials of a story into as few words as possible into a really accessible format, which is extremely similar to what radio news has always done. And because RNZ has its amazing sort of in-depth team and has these long form or, or longer form interviews that, that happen in, uh, in both its sort of primetime shows and it's in its more magazine uh, style shows that, that run between, there's actually a, a great mix of, of fast and slow or short and long that it could put together if it went about creating its digital product in a different way. So much as this is a very unfortunate and will be a, a really traumatizing time for, for RNZ as an organization, it does contain the opportunity to really rethink what it is and how it operates. So hopefully that, that is, is ultimately where this ends because RNZ is, has a unique and very important place in, uh, in New Zealand's news ecosystem. And, you know, it, it's really important to, you know, I think to, to the whole of the media that it comes out of this and in better shape than it went in. Uh, I'm going to touch on another couple of stories very briefly, uh, at least by my own for both standards uh, before we go. Um, firstly, Sinead Boucher has recently stepped down or announced that she's stepping down as CEO of Stuff. I think that's um, a pretty extraordinary innings that she's had. If you look at when she assumed the chief executive role, it was just before um, Ardern uh, took over as prime minister and she, she leaves just after. So, And I think there is something in the, the comparison in that both of them sort of you know, had to steer these, these very important institutions through times of acute stress um, and really emphasize the sort of public good or the sort of the social contract element of, um, you know, government and, and stuff as a media institution, respectively. Uh, there, there's some things that, that uh, Boucher oversaw at stuff that are, you know, fascinating, impactful on a world scale. I think the first one was the decision to leave Facebook. Turned out to be incredibly prescient. Face, you know, the fact of saying it publicly and saying to your audience, you cannot get your news on Facebook anymore. That was just brilliantly timed and conceived. It made her famous around the world in news circles. She's spoken, you know, all over the world to, to explain the thinking there and stuff to their credit, you, they haven't really seen an audience decline. They did manage to, by this one big public statement, transfer audience behavior from I'll see my news on Facebook to I'll go to stuff to 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 get that to get my news. And honestly we, we all should have done the same. Like the amount of traffic that we get from Facebook has steadily declined, but we haven't had that big bang moment of saying, do not go there. Suffice it to say, if you read the spinoff and you're wondering why you don't see as much of it on Facebook, it's because Facebook is deliberately, very deliberately decreasing the distribution of news on the platform for its own reasons. You've got to, you know, whether it's downloading the app and turning on push notifications, subscribe to a newsletter, that this is true of all news organizations. That is the way that you have to consume it now. You just cannot rely on social media for, for distribution the way you once could. So that was just that alone would make her tenure incredibly noteworthy, but um, but there's also the purchase. You know, she she bought stuff for a dollar. Turned out to be an incredible bargain, but at the time, it was one of the boldest and bravest moves um, we've seen in, in in a very long time. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people saying that if it's not this, then um, you know this whole company might go to the wall. Really, really two really really impressive things. They've also launched their paywalls. I still think that there's some kind of design issues there. I, you know, if, if I'm honest, I think having three products potentially more to come versus turning stuff into a a metered paywall product might prove to be wrong. But again, I I could well be wrong myself. But the the fact of getting them to that point um, is also a really impressive element. But you know, like I do like likely very gassed by the moment and yeah you know, I think this probably brings to 
I heard that the last and um, element is I think that they've she's done succession very well. Laura Maxwell, XNZ Me, has taken over. I don't know Laura. I've never met her to, to my knowledge, but one of the things that she oversaw at NZ Me was One Roof and. I'm a huge admirer of that product. That's that's basically their digital real estate product. It is beautifully designed. They've smartly integrated it with the, you know, the big traffic monster that is the Herald's homepage. They've created content that wraps around this core digital product. And it is it is as far as a, a digital product to, that integrates with uh, real estate listings and, and wraps content around that. It's just really well thought through and put together and fundamentally, if you're going to be a media executive in this era, then your, re your job is to essentially make a really brilliant and coherent digital product that you can wrap your business strategy around. And, and I think by recruiting Laura, who's, who's overseen, you know, I think probably to my mind, NZME's most impressive digital product. Uh, you know, it just looks like a really sharp piece of recruitment. So, um, you know, applaud Sinead for, for all that she's accomplished and really look forward to seeing what Laura will do with, uh, with stuff going forward. Um, finally, just a quick note on the DIA online content review, which we talked about with uh, Anna and Shanti a couple of weeks ago. I, I read yesterday uh, Daniel Dunkley, who has been a long time uh, media reporter for Business Desk, brilliant, maybe usurped now by the, the media in, insider, you know, I, at some point I'm going to get Shane Curry on this podcast because that guy has come out of the, the blocks with an incredible energy and scope um, with his new uh, media insider column. But but Daniel is is very good at giving a, a smart, well-reported uh, sense of those, those kind of big beats of the, the media story in, in New Zealand. And he, he published a piece uh, recently that looked into the media industry's misgivings around this DIA document, um, this discussion document that may well ultimately become law that will introduce basically a, a level playing field across all digital media. And I think, you know, the, the more I've kind of read uh, read it and, and sort of sat with it, the more I think there is something in the concerns of the, the big media bosses about news media content being treated with a harm lens and being put into the same bucket as social media. And obviously, we're at the start of a consultation process. If I had to bet, I would be pretty strongly, I'd be, be fairly confident that there will be that the existing process around the media council and BSA will be sort of protected within this uh, new mega ministry or sort of mega regulator. But but it does need to happen because the the sort of harm centric vision uh, of of how content regulation will evolve in when applied to media can it really can have a chilling effect. Um, and it, you know, there is a world where a whole lot of very legitimate, actually quite important debate is uh, impacted negatively uh, by this this regulator, which obviously has a pretty profound impact on us as a society and democracy. Um, so, yeah, I recommend seeking out uh, Daniel's piece there, and you know, th just thinking hard about uh, the that 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 regulation piece that there's a lot I think that's very positive about the idea of regulating uh, all me online media content with a with a much more you know just trying to bring a, a level of fairness into the way that we are we are regulated but news just it is its own animal and it needs to be protected I think uh, anyway that is uh, a monopod from me uh, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm about to go away for six weeks, um, a, a, a holiday that's directly connected to my resignation earlier this year. Uh, I've recorded episodes to run through to, from now till uh, the start of July, uh, and I think they're great. They will necessarily not be as timely as, as uh, you know, if there's some big new media story breaks 
Um, I will not be around to to address it. Potentially one of my colleagues will jump in, but um, I thank you for listening to the fold and bearing with me while I um, am a long way from this microphone and I'll be back. I'll be here every week, but also back in August to, to uh, bring a fresh and hopefully refreshed tone and, and presence to this microphone. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. <laughs>